Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, uh, today we, we are here in the Sanford School. We're gonna be holding a virtual program with foundation program officers. Thanks to everyone attending. Um, what we're gonna be doing today is having uh, the, the program officers talk a little bit about their programs and the things that they support, but also have uh, Becky Sandifer uh, moderate uh, the panel, but also have, we'll have some time at the end of this for the last 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes of having a Q and A. But before we start, I wanna first thank our program officers um, for attending and being willing to participate. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Sam and uh, Becky for being a part of this and helping organize this. So I'm gonna do a quick introduction of our program officers. Uh, Axia Cintron Velez is the program director at the Rosa Sage Foundation. She manages the scientific portfolio for the Future Work Program and the Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration Program. She has also directed foundation initiatives on the socioeconomic and political effects of the implementations of the Affordable Care Act in the U.S., care work, immigration and cultural contact, race and policing, and the consequences of low-wage work in advanced industrial economies. Before joining Russell Sage, she was a research associate at the Center for Hispanic Mental Health Research and taught the Graduate School of Social Service at Fordham University. Prior to Fordham, she was a faculty member at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she taught research methods and social policy. She has done research and written about urban and low-wage labor markets and the family, employment, and migration careers of Latinas in the United States. Earlier in her career, she directed a vocational counseling and training program for low-income women at Casa Central, the large Hispanic social services agency in Chicago's North Side. She was an NIPC fellow in intergovernmental, intergovernmental affairs with the city of Chicago's Department of Planning, and she was the program officer for education and economic development at Chicago-based Joyce Foundation. She holds a PhD in sociology and social welfare policy from the University of Michigan and, and, and a master's in social service administration from the University of Chicago and a BA psychology in the University of Puerto Rico. So thanks for joining us. Jenny Irons is a program officer at William T. Grant Foundation where she leads the foundation's grant making uh, programs on reducing inequality. From 2003 to 2013, she was an assistant and then associate professor of sociology at Hamilton College. Her research and teaching focused on race, gender, and social moods, and she published peer-reviewed articles, essays, and a book, Reconstituting Whiteness, the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. Jenny earned her PhD in sociology from the University of Arizona and her BA in socio sociology and anthropology in Miltaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. Chris, Chris O'Brien, well, whose background is in the Philadelphia area, received her BS degree at St. Joseph's University and a Master's of Arts degree in education at Villanova. Uh, Chris taught for six years in the parochial school system for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia prior to working in fellowship administration at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in Washington, D.C. Chris has worked in the administration of publicly and privately funded fellowships for over 48 years at the National Academies. Fellowships uh, and minister included the, at the pre-doctoral dissertation and postdoctoral levels. Along with a colleague, Chris created a fellowship roundtable table in 1995. This biannual meeting uh, brings together fellowship administrators whose goal is to, to share best practices and discuss innovations in the administration of fellowships. The fellowship roundtable is in its 27th year. Chris has worked with the administration of four foundations since 1979. These fellowships are to are designed to increase and support diversity in higher education. Thanks for joining us. And Becky Sandifer investigates, our moderator, investigates access to civil justice from every angle, from how legal services are delivered and consumed, to how civil legal aid is organized around the nation, to the role of pro bono, to the relatively efficacy of lawyers, non-lawyers, and digital tools as advisors and representatives to how ordinary people think about their justice problems and to try to resolve them. In addition to her appointment at ASU, uh, Becky is a fac faculty fellow at the American Bar Foundation where she is founded and leads the access to justice research in initiatives. Uh, her public service includes her appointment by the Supreme Court of Utah to the state's Office of Legal Services Innovation. Her role as co-vice chair of California's Closing the Justice 
CAP Working Group and her appointment by the Supreme Court of Arizona to the Arizona Commission on Access to Justice. In 2013, Becky was the Hague Visiting Chair in the Rule of Law. In 2015, she was also named the Champion of Justice by the National Center of Access to Justice. In 2018, she was named the MacArthur Fellow for her work on inequality and access to justice. And in 2020, she was awarded the Warren E. Berger Award for the National Center of State of course, and she is currently the editor of Law and Society Review. So thanks to everyone for being a part of this panel. I'm going to hand it over now to our moderator, uh, Becky Sandifer, uh, to engage with our esteemed guests and their program officers. So thank you. Thanks, Anthony. And thank you again to, to, our, to our guests for spending, spending a little bit of time with us here. I think it would be great if each of you just took like a minute or two and told us about the foundation you work at and what kinds of stuff it funds. Um, Jenny, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. And thanks. Thanks for having me here today. It's great to, um, in a virtual world, be able to do these kinds of events more easily. So I am at the William T. Grant Foundation, where we fund research on youth ages 5 to 25 in the United States. We have uh, a few different funding programs, but one of the important things to know about the foundation is that we fund research in two different areas. So your research might be a fit with the foundation if you are um, proposing a study to examine ways to reduce inequality among young people ages five to 25 in the United States. And I'll just underscore that the focus of the project really has to be on reducing inequality rather than describing or documenting or explaining the bad consequences of inequality. And our other main focus area is that we fund research um, that examines ways to improve the use of research evidence and policy and practice. So it's a very new and interdisciplinary field of folks who are trying to figure out whether and how using rigorous research actually improves youth outcomes um, and policy and practice. Um, and I, I know we may talk about this earlier, but I'll just flag we have some different grant programs. Our grant making is fairly stable over time. We have very set deadlines and set funding processes. We um, fund major grants, and there are different um, size awards we fund. We have a William T. Grant Scholars Program. I see Rebecca White is here. She can maybe fill in, fill us in a little bit about that, which is our early career development program. And we have an institutional challenge grant program, um, which is for more senior scholars and folks who are in administrative roles to really um, encourage institutions to award community-based research um, among faculty members and to award connections to um, community agencies and groups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Exia, do you want to tell us about Russell Sage? You're muted. <laughs> I was telling my fellow panelists earlier that Russell Sage is a very old place and all places change slowly, but I'm happy to report that we are um, expanding and diversifying in, in, in good and productive ways. Um, we have an increasingly diverse board and uh, advisory committees. We're extending our reach to uh, purposefully uh, include advanced grad students and early career scholars. And we are expanding the type of activities that we support. Before, you would probably uh, learn about us uh, and our uh, grant awards uh, competitions, the Presidential Authority Awards, the Trustee Level Awards, our book publishing program, and our residential fellowships. But now we also have something that we call the Pipeline Grants Competition for early career scholars, assistant professors, and as early associate professors. Uh, our dissertation grant uh, awards, and our summer institutes. And the foundation um, has a pattern of supporting basic social science research. So, you know, uh, it's policy, we support policy relevant research, but not necessarily policy uh, research. Um, our main program areas include um, a longstanding program on social inequality, uh, a program on labor markets, especially the um, low, uh, less skilled and moderately skilled labor markets, a program on behavior economics, uh, and the program on race, ethnicity, and immigration. 
Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Anthony, for inviting our office to participate today. I work at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in Washington, DC. And we have an office dedicated to the administration of fellowships. And I'm here primarily today to speak about Ford Foundation fellowships. Uh, we do have other fellowships as well. Uh, we have a new one uh, funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And that's uh, for individuals who already have the doctorate who are in biomedical fields. Uh, and that one is called the Science Diversity Leadership Award. And a brand new program we have is the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And it's for individuals who want to go to law school and become civil rights lawyers. And so, uh, but primarily today, I, I want to speak about the Ford Foundation Fellowship Program. The program came to us in 1979, but it already had been in existence since 1962. The Ford Foundation wanted to diversify the professoriate. And so the program still has that as its goal to strengthen and support diversity in higher education. And we have pre-doctoral dissertation and postdoctoral awards. And we also have uh, other postdoctoral awards. Our website is really rich with information on other fellowship programs, some that we administer, some that other institutions administer. So I invite anyone who's participating today to check out our website. We have a directory of Ford Fellows, and uh, that's a really interesting directory uh, because some of the individuals who had Ford Fellowships uh, went on to become public scholars, and some of the names will be very familiar. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Becky, for allowing me to introduce myself. Thank you. So now I'm going to, to offer some questions to the panel. And I think I'm going to start with a, a behind the veil kind of a question. So, um, you know, if, if we go to your websites or look at your materials, there'll be like deadlines and names and lists of things that are supported and people who've been supported. And then you all are program officers and program officers are mysterious and maybe all powerful. We don't even know. So could you say a little bit about what your role is and then how you can be helpful to people who are exploring opportunities for funding? I'll let, I'll let you self-organize who's going to start. <laughs> okay, well, um, usually offices, and I'll speak for the office I work in, we have a set format for individuals who need a question answered, whether it's about the content of the application or the procedures to follow. Uh, the recommendations for all of our fellowships come from past reviewers. So uh, what I would say is that an applicant really needs to dedicate time to reading the instructions and following them because they're highly competitive uh, fellowships. For, at the Ford, for the Ford Foundation fellowships, we receive about 2,600 applications for only 135 awards. And so the individuals who really follow the instructions to the letter have a much higher chance of receiving an award. Um, Program officers do things like uh, recruit reviewers, and that's something that I do at the National Academies. Uh, when we attend meetings to uh, speak with faculty members and students who are interested in our fellowships, we also circulate to make sure faculty and administrators know about our fellowships. And we also ask them, would they be interested in being a reviewer of our fellowships? Uh, the Ford Foundation funds the social sciences, but also the STEM fields, behavioral sciences, and the humanities, and also interdisciplinary areas. So we're always on the lookout for uh, faculty members who are willing to uh, perform a volunteer task. They do not get paid for being a reviewer, uh, but that's a very important task. Uh, I feel it is because they ultimately have the decision uh, making power to to score someone um, very competitively. Thank so you. I, I tend to describe myself as a matchmaker between new and interesting ideas and Rosa Sage and between new and interesting people 
and uh, the foundation. Um, and as of lately, I've also been uh, trying to establish partnerships with other uh, funders, especially funders uh, that have deeper pockets than Rosa Sage, because Rosa Sage has very ambitious, uh, a very ambitious research agenda. Um, but if we're on our own, we can only fund a handful of, of, of projects in a specific topic. Whereas if we um, partner with another funder, we may be able to, to stretch uh, relatively scarce dollars to make more of an impact in, in a particular uh, area of research. Um, besides that, like Christine, I organize um, review panels. I um, put together advisory committees and I'm the person who will pitch a project to the board of trustees. We have a very engaged uh, board of trustees. And uh, even though we have uh, a panel of experts that we call our advisory committee, um, our trustees feel that they can, you know, raise a question and um, challenge the recommendation of uh, our advisory committee. So I am the person who translates uh, the project uh, to the trustees and who makes uh, the sales pitch uh, because in the end, they are the, the body that um, makes a decision about whether to support a project or not. Thank you. Well, I'll say a little bit about um, the role of a program officer at the William T. Grant Foundation. It varies somewhat depending on what grant programs we work with. So for example, for our scholars program and our institutional challenge grant program, there are um, external review boards who help us make decisions about what grants get awarded but for our major grants program, and, and I should say that everything goes out for external review in that case, but for our major grants program, um, what I do is I, I participate in every phase of the grant making process. So we review our initial, the initial stage letters of inquiry that come in. So if you were interested in applying for a major grant at the foundation, you would submit a five page letter of inquiry. Uh, program officers review those. We're all PhD level. We come from different backgrounds, which is why it's always important to avoid um, really particular academic jargon when you submit an application so that a PhD level person can understand what you're talking about and can understand your research design. Um, we review those letters of inquiry. We make decisions about which um, applicants we invite to submit full proposals and what matters there is the degree to which something fits with our interests, whether the proposed research design is going to answer the questions asked, et cetera. And then when we get full proposals that come back in as they're coming in today, we um, do the same thing that Chris mentioned. We, we figure out which folks we're going to ask to be external reviewers. And of course, we always seek to identify reviewers who are a good match for reviewing both the substantive and methodological work proposed in a study. Um, as you can imagine, if you've ever tried to recruit a reviewer for anything, um, that can be a very difficult task. So that's actually one of the more challenging things we do is find uh, good external reviewers because we want people to get good reviews helpful, constructive reviews, no matter whether they move along in our process or not. So that is always our goal. Um, and then um, when we receive those external reviews, um, we make decisions then about which um, applicants we ask to respond to concerns. So at that stage, some people are declined and others are asked to respond to concerns. And so um, I forget this, but along the way, like we, we, we do have, we're very involved um, in deciding which applications move forward and, and which ones don't. Um, and then, but then at the very final stage, before we decide which proposals to recommend to our board for approval, members of our senior program team review the proposals and the external reviews very carefully. There are only um, five of us on staff who do that, the three program officers, the vice president of program and our president. We have two senior program associates who were on um, very accomplished scholars in their field to help us make these decisions. And it's, it's always, um, I know you don't feel sorry for program officers, but it's always very challenging because we don't have enough money to fund all the awards that we wanna fund. And so we always have to make hard decisions about which proposals to recommend to our board um, and which proposals to decline. But it's exciting because you know we, um, we are getting to fund really excellent work and, and support really good scholars. So um, it's, it's always interesting and I'm always happy to learn a lot. And uh, Becky, 
in terms of your question of how program officers can help or, or what applicants need to think about, in general, because we're such a small staff, we encourage people to use the resources on our website to answer questions you have and to evaluate whether or not your, your work might be a good fit with our interest. If there's a question that's not answered, I encourage you to, to reach out to one of us. But one thing we can't do, for example, is we don't review um, applications before they come in. And we don't generally um, don't have the time in our schedule to, to just have a conversation to say whether or not your work might be a fit. Um, however, you know, when we go to meetings, we visit campuses, those are good opportunities to have those kinds of conversations. Thank you. So one of the things that I think came out from everyone's remarks for me is that um, program, program officers are playing pretty important roles in facilitating and advocating for different kinds of research. And so when you're interacting with them, you might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> that there are, that if you're going to reach out to them for questions, you want to reach out for them to, for questions you really can't get answers to in other ways. And then they're, you know, they're, they have the potential to be your advocate to move your work forward. So you want to be as kind and, um, and gracious to them as you, as you can. Um, so we've, we've heard, we've heard about a range of different kinds of funding. So some of it's research funding, some of it's what I think of as like person funding. So fellowships that give people freedom and capacity to do things. When you're thinking about the kinds of of proposals that you get, could you tell us a little bit about what makes for a strong one and what kinds of mistakes people should look out to avoid? So Chris made a really good point, which, I mean, we all think our ideas are wonderful, but every, every portal has its requirements about how to share those ideas, right? That's what those instructions are. It's really important to follow those, those instructions. And so a, even a brilliant idea that doesn't follow the rules at that stage uh, might, you know, has a, a big chance of not getting noticed. So what are some, what are some tips, I guess, either what to avoid or what to focus on that, that you could give us based on your experience? So in general, we're looking for uh, what we call exciting new, uh, either research questions or an exciting new angle uh, for an old question. Uh, we are looking for clever research designs um, and we're looking for new underutilized and innovative uh, sources of data. Um, so that's, that's what we're aiming for. So for example, if you're a uh, quantitatively trained researcher uh, and you propose to use uh, widely available uh, public use data source and do uh, routine descriptive analysis, you probably don't have a good chance of standing out uh, among all the proposals that we uh, receive. So uh, if I had a, a shortcut to give to you all, I would say if you're a quantitative researcher, uh, you will have to uh, uh, have answers to questions about power identification strategy, robustness checks. If you're uh, a qualitatively trained uh, researcher, you want to be able to say something about uh, site and sample selection strategy. You want to show that um, you have preliminary findings or pilot project data. Uh, in, in other contexts, we would call that a proof of concept uh, for your project. Um, if you're doing in-depth qualitative interviews, you probably want to include a draft interview protocol. And I think that probably the most important um, uh, recommendation that I can make is if you uh, present yourself or think of yourself as a mixed methods researcher, I would say lead with your strengths. Uh, don't, don't call uh, your project mixed methods uh, project if you're a qualitatively uh, trained researcher who is just going to use um, uh, survey data to contextualize your findings, for example. Um, so uh, in terms of where to begin, uh, I would say subscribe to our newsletter, review the program announcements uh, for deadlines, uh, review recent research awards uh, by program area, and probably the um, 
the most important thing or, or most useful thing uh, that others uh, have mentioned or highlighted is to uh, check our grant writing resources uh, section on the website uh, because it will include sample LOIs, sample proposals, uh, and most people find that uh, particularly helpful. Thank you. We have other other insights here. Um, I'll try to think of some things to share that you might not get from our website. Um, I think I'll just underscore again the point about following directions. That comment always makes me think about when I was an undergrad. Um, I went to the Don't Be Jealous Mississippi Alabama Sociology Conference, and I won best undergraduate paper. And when they announced it. They said, because this is the only paper we got where she included everything she was supposed to include. So I was like, ah, I won because I was a rule follower. <laughs> um, but it is very important to include all, all the documents to, you know, to read the application guidance and to make sure you're trying as best you can to address every point. Um, one of the things I see sometimes that's perplexing is uh, you, the, our initial stage of application for a major grant is a five page letter of inquiry. It's not a lot of room to say everything you wanna say. Some people don't use all of that space. You know, if, you're, if your application, your initial stage application is three and a half pages or even four pages, it's not long enough. Like you need, you need to take advantage of that space, explain where your question is. And I will say across all of our grant programs, one of the things that we look for, I mean, we're a research, we are a foundation that funds research is that the, there are good questions and there's a research design that is aligned with those questions that is going to provide the most rigorous answers possible to those questions, whether the study is quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods. Those things need to be aligned or otherwise um, an application is not likely to move forward in our process. I mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll underscore this again. Um, it's important you know, not, not to use a lot of jargon that is particular to your field, but to be able to explain your ideas clearly. So what I encourage people to do is to have other people in your department read um, your application, but have people perhaps outside your department read your application so that you're, while you may feel like you've written a great application, sometimes I talk to people who are perplexed when they didn't get funded and I have to say, I, we did not understand what you were proposing to do. And we're not, I mean, we're fairly smart people. So, you know, really have other people read what you're doing and see if they understand that. Um, and two, I'll say, you know, we, um, we fund research across different youth serving systems. Um, I don't know how many of you are education researchers, but certainly a lot of the work we fund is in the field of education. So then you really gotta make yourself stand out if you're, if you're conducting research that's related to uh, K through 12 or higher ed in some way, because um, we really, that's where we really wanna see innovative um, work coming forward. I'll just underscore another interest of ours right now in the reducing inequality area is that um, while it's hard to do, we're interested in seeing proposals um, from folks who are really thinking about ways to address the structural foundations of inequality and to, to disrupt that. And it's, again, hard work to do, um, but that's a special interest we have right now within our reducing inequality focus area. And so we're particularly interested in seeing applications that take on that challenge. Thank you. I'd like to follow on uh, what Aixa said and also what Jenny said. Aixa mentioned being a matchmaker. Uh, the way an applicant can match with a reviewer is by carefully selecting keywords. Each applicant is asked to select a variety of keywords and the reviewers do that as well. And so the way the applications are then assigned is a keyword match. Uh, Something Jenny said that I would underscore actually two things. One is to consult with faculty in selecting your keywords. Uh, try to be specific in the selection of your keywords and also um, get opinions from the faculty about what you've written. Many of them have been reviewers for other fellowships and they can give you ex uh, advice from their experience and it's very beneficial to lean on that advice. Uh, Jenny mentioned having a small staff and we have a small staff and we receive so many applications, we cannot check every upload. So it's very important that you carefully upload the various essays as unfortunately some people, the, they'll submit a proposed plan of study and then they'll submit it again where a different essay should be like uh, their personal statement. So, we don't catch that when that is noticed is after they've gone to the reviewers 
for evaluation and it's too late to fix anything like that. So um, anyway, I just, I think that uh, I'm really happy with the fact that some of what we're stating today is overlapping because it's going to be beneficial to those who are preparing applications to follow the instructions closely and then to work hard so that you choose really good keywords if you're applying for a Ford Fellowship to assure that there's a good match with reviewers who are in your discipline. Thank you. So um, those of us who applied for funding from someplace know that most of the time you don't get it. <laughs> uh, so you're usually doing it more than once. Um, can you tell us about what your what the policies and expectations are where you work around kind of revise and resubmit, we'd call it in the journal world. Like if it doesn't work the first time, um, are we allowed to try again? <laughs> yes, so, you, can, you as long as you meet the eligibility requirements, you can apply again. And our hope is that when you receive constructive comments from the reviewers, you will have some idea of which parts of the application you can strengthen for a resubmission. So in, in general, I think that expectations about the review process, um, I would highlight the fact that it would probably take uh, six months of peer review um, for you to find out if, uh, and this is the best case scenario. That means a successful LOI that received strong, positive, consistent uh, support from uh, reviewers. Then you were invited to submit a proposal. That proposal uh, received strong, uh, positive reviews. And then the proposal goes to an advisory committee. The advisory committee um, uh, requests a response to reviewer comments and then they make a recommendation to the trustees for uh, uh, to support a project. So you can expect that if everything goes smoothly, uh, it would take about six months and you will be approached uh, several times along the way to uh, provide answers to, to questions. In general, you, we end up funding uh, in our regular uh, programs or our core uh, program areas, about 10% of, uh, of those that come our way in the form of an MOI. So if we had 360 something um, LOIs for one of the three uh, review cycles, you can expect that at the end we'll make like 10 awards between presidential level and trustee level awards. Um, it's a little bit different for the dissertation grants. I think that we can expect to fund uh, about 20 of those and the same with the pipeline uh, grants competition. We, we can expect to fund about 20 of those. Um, I, that, Becky, that's a great question and I would I definitely encourage people to apply again. Um, I always mention our William T. Grant Scholars Program for which applicants often apply two and sometimes three times before they're successful. It doesn't mean everyone who applies, unfortunately, two or three times will be successful, but um, there, are, there are, and it's not uncommon for someone to get for the William T. Grant Scholars Program where you go through um, external review and advisory committee review and the finalists are brought in for an interview. There are people who interview one year and don't get it go back and really engage with the reviews. So if you are fortunate enough to get reviews back from a funder, because not every, in our case, for example, we aren't able to give feedback to every letter of inquiry we decline. But if you get reviews back, the important thing is to take those reviews seriously and respond to them. Um, there are some cases where, for example, whatever reviewer suggests doesn't work, and there may be a rationale for why that's the case, but um, at least for our scholars program, um, people who make it to the final stage get feedback, for example, about their interview. And if they come back the next year and it's clear they haven't taken that um, information to heart at all, then they're probably unlikely to get the award. So I encourage people to apply again. Um, one thing we noticed, especially is that um, uh, researchers of color often is less likely to apply again than white researchers. So I just underscore everyone is welcome to apply again. We especially encourage researchers of color to apply again. 
Um, and, and, you know, in some cases, if you're not getting feedback or feedback is unclear, that's a case where I think it's okay to reach out and ask. Like, I, you know, I don't understand this or I'm really committed to the work of this foundation and I'd like to apply again. Would you be able to have a call with me to talk through some of this feedback? And I will say when, when someone writes me after a proposal was declined and, and they want to talk through the feedback, I always say yes to that um, because I think it, it, it's certainly the right thing to do to help people process the, the feedback that they receive. So by all means, apply again, take the feedback to heart if you get it, incorporate it in, in the way that works best for your study um, and reach out if you have questions. And I think one of the things you're hearing is, um, particularly for these processes that, that are being described, there's a lot of work that's going into making these decisions, not just from the foundation to where you send the thing, but all the different levels of review that are giving input into, into your work. And so another thing that's happening, even if you don't get any reviews back, and even if you don't get the money, um, is a lot of people have seen that you're out there doing that thing. You've now been kind of shown to the world in a way, and that's a, a value to you, even though you may not notice it when you're waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, I want to open it up in just a second to, to folks who are who are watching for any questions that they have. But Rebecca White um, has received money from funders, um, and I wondered if she wanted to say anything or pose any question to our to our panel based on her experience. Well, I am um, very fortunate to have been one of um, the William T. Grant Foundation Scholars awardees. And, um, and I can't, I have no experience with either of the other foundations except for writing letters of support for um, doctoral trainees who have applied to both. Um, but I do wanna just, as my personal experience at the um, foundation, William T. Grant Foundation was um, a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, and I imagine the other pipeline and uh, early career programs at the other foundations are similar in that they are really trying to develop the full scholar um, in a really supportive environment. Um, it was everything that I could like, I'm like a nerdy and, and sciencey, but um, it was also supportive and it pushed me and it gave me exposure to other scholars who were addressing you know, related issues um, from different perspectives. It was rich. I mean, really, really, really rich. And I find these early career scholar programs to generally be like that um, from the foundations, less so um, from like the, like the, you know, NIH type perspective, where I think they kind of give you the money and put you out there. Um, I really found my William T. Grant Scholar Foundation experience to be so meaningful, probably like the most meaningful thing in my entire career that I could possibly imagine. Um, and I just developed as a, as, a, as a scientist and I'm really thankful for that. So I say apply to these types of programs because they tend to be really rich and really supportive um, in ways that you know sometimes some of the federal money really isn't. Becky, can I, can I say something to follow up to that? Yes. Um, oh, thank no. you, Rebecca. <laughs> I can't help it. I really can't help myself. Like, I know it sounds, you know, hatred. I don't know. Anyway, but I, re I really, really do believe it. No, Pete, I mean, it is, it is common for people to call that particular uh, participation in that program life-changing, career-changing, and, and, and in part because people get this award because they um, demonstrate ways they want to stretch their interests. So it gives you the capacity over the course of five years to um, stretch your methodological expertise, your substantive expertise in ways you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So it's pushing people to do something different that they, than they, what they were planning to do. So there's that. But I will also say that this is the kind of application where you wanna plan way in advance. It's one thing to submit a five page letter of inquiry for a major grant, which of course you should take the time to prepare carefully to do. But when you're applying for a career development award like scholars um, and, and other things, that's a kind of award we tell people, if you're not planning a year in advance for your application, you're probably waiting too late. Because for that program in particular, you have to identify mentors, you have to work with them on developing a mentoring plan. These are intense applications. So be sure you take the time to think in advance about how to put a good, strong application together. Thank you. Can I add that that year of preparation, I had more growth in preparing my application that I had in the prior four years, you know, as an assistant professor, like I was afraid to reach out to people and ask them for help. But then this, this, this program like made me do it. Like if I was going to do this program then I had to reach out to people. And um, those were just the types of kind of pushes. I, like I, by the time I made it to the interview, 
I had grown so much as a scholar. I was, you know, I remember being in the new room saying like, just getting to this point has pushed me as a scholar in ways that I could have never imagined. And that was, uh, nobody had given me any money at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So do we have questions from the, the folks who were, who were watching? Behind the little squares, the little static squares, are there people back there? <laughs> Please, yeah. Um, I, I think it was uh, Alexa who mentioned behavioral economics models. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I think that the, the name of the program has changed a little bit. It's something like human behavior in context and decision making. But uh, this was our attempt to not just appeal to economists, uh, which were the uh, obvious target group when we use the umbrella term behavior economics, and to include political scientists and psychologists who were also doing work around uh, decision making and human behavior. So I guess this is a fit question because um, I'm an addictions researcher. I run um, a a bar lab so we actually serve beverages and we're trying to figure out when people make good or bad decisions and i follow behavioral economics theories about when people will make good or bad decisions um we're looking at things like childhood trauma um impulsivity and self-control constructs but then also we want to give people choices online in terms of hey we can give you $12 to not drink, or you can punch this card and here you will get your, your alcoholic beverage and those sorts of things. So I don't know if that's like way too left field for you guys. I just want to kind of like find a place because um, I've received NIAAA funding before and um, the Burton Family Foundation funding before, but um, I'm looking for other sources where we're looking at social determinants um, and then also doing experimental manipulations and looking at true decision making about whether to drink to excess or not. Um, so it depends on how you frame the outcomes. Um, okay. If it's not just a mental health outcome or a physical health outcome, or um, but you can frame it in terms that are a good match uh, to Rosa's interest in inequality, uh, for example. Uh, then you, you're on the right track. The person who knows the most about this program is Liana Chatra, C-H-A-T-R-A-T-H. Um, and just taking a quick look at what we have recently funded under the program may give you an idea of um, how you, you would frame the project uh, in terms that would appeal to, to Russell's age. Okay. I have another question if no one else does, but if other people do, I want to take turns. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Is there anyone else hiding behind a square that wants to ask something? I think the floor is still yours. Well, a lot of you talked about um, inequality as a potential area to fund. And um, in my field, inequality goes beyond just racial and ethnic groups. Um, most of the work in my field has only been conducted on men and not on women. And so if you look at literature reviews, there's a huge gap in the literature where only a small handful of women have even been studied and it's not a powerful enough test. Would that be something that I could, I don't wanna say get away with as being an inequality, but in, in the way I look at it, if you know we're looking at heart attacks in men and women and you only study men, you're forgetting half of the population. And in my field of alcohol self-administration, they have forgotten women because people don't wanna administer the pregnancy test. They won't wanna deal with the fact that 25% of the population is on a, an, antidepressant just because you know they're dismissed because they're women and all these other kind of things and so um we know how to do that safely and things like that and so to me in terms of uh, inequality it is more of a cisgender inequality rather than a racial inequality 
And I don't know if any of you are interested in that because right now everything seems to be about racial inequality, which is beautiful. But I also wanted to know if you guys were open to that as well. So if you can make it fit under social, economic, political uh, inequality, uh, uh -huh. gender is a key axis of social differentiation. So uh, cool. if it has an impact on social, economic, or, or political outcomes that are different for men and women, uh, you're good. OK, awesome. Um, I'll just say that for the William T. Grant Foundation, the priority dimensions of inequality that we usually support are race, ethnicity, um, immigrant origin, language minority status, <clears throat> and economic standing. And we've increasingly encouraged um, studies of ways to reduce inequality for LGBTQ youth as well. But we do say if you're studying a dimension other than the ones we pri prioritize, we look for a compelling case um, for why um, we might support that work. But for us, the key focus is on reducing inequality rather than describing and documenting, documenting, it, documenting it. And of course, on um, individuals ages five to 25. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and the way the Ford Foundation guidelines are written, there are certain groups that are specified as those that have been traditionally underrepresented in higher education. But it also goes on to say that the panelists should carefully consider the diversity of human experience. And so there has been diversity ever since the program opened up several years ago. Uh, there have been individuals from all different racial and ethnic groups, uh, some who deal with um, physical disabilities or they have something that makes them stand out as one who would be uh, an exemplary person in the front of a college classroom who has overcome difficulties in a whole variety of ways. And so I think the key would be to write your proposed plan in such a way and your personal statement that you do stand out because uh, of these factors. So uh, it is possible if it's uh, not based on racial or ethnic diversity, some other forms of diversity have uh, been demonstrated in applications and have received awards. Awesome. Do you have another question from behind the squares? Anthony has a question. Yes, I do. So I, I think when I think about all, especially being as an early career scholar, um, one of the things I feel like I did not take advantage of I wish it could go back in time or a lot of the foundation as well as uh, many of the foundations provide workshops at conferences and sometimes they provide um, panels for themselves like they you can get on a listserv and they announce these kind of informative, um, I don't know if tutorial is the right word, but like these information talking about foundations and the grants and the different types of fellowships. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that, especially for the early careers, like how one of the biggest things is actually having access to that information and being aware of um, different avenues of trying to access that type of information, not only just the website, but also when they attend conferences and look for that, um, those type of workshops that um, some of you uh, provide? So increasingly, we have moved in the direction of uh, providing short webinars um, and posting them. And that's a great introduction uh, to the foundation and to a review process. And we realized that you don't have a lot of time. So this is a, a good way to, uh, or a good introduction to, uh, to what we do and how your work may fit or not. Yeah, we, I mean, um... We often do funder panels at different conferences and you're, you're right, that's a great way to go and learn about different types of funding activities. So for example, we always do one with Russell Sage and Spencer at the American Sociological Association meetings. Um, we usually have a, a presence of some sort at um, American Educational Research Association, Maine Psychology Conferences, APAM. So we're often at the, the big um, conferences. But another thing that we do, um, and Rebecca, you may remember, I think Adam, did Adam visit ASU in the past several years? Yeah, we often do campus visits. And so 
if you see that a, a foundation is visiting your campus and you're invited to an opportunity to, to attend those, um, that's another great way to learn about funding. But also what we do is these sort of rapid fire visits with individual faculty members who can you know, take 10 minutes or so to pitch their idea um, and, and have that kind of interaction with, um, with officers. So that's, that's something to do as well. I would say that, I mean, another thing you can think about doing is when your colleagues or someone you know publishes their work and they have a tagline or they say this work was funded by the so-and-so foundation, reach out and talk to them. Like, how did you get that funding? How did you find out about it? I mean, these are big conversations that folks don't always have. Um, another thing I'll mention is that a lot of the work we fund, it, we fund especially for our um, major grants initiative, is that these are interdisciplinary teams uh, and for people across universities. So I encourage early career scholars um, to like latch on to a team because it's, it's like if you can pair up with a more senior scholar at your, your university or another university, it's a great way to learn about the grants process. How do you manage a large grant? Because when you're applying for your own grants, one of the things that um, uh, reviewers will look for is do you have the capability to lead a large study? Like, is this person capable of managing a huge grant, leading a large team? And to get that kind of experience, you probably need to be part of a team um, conducting a, a big research project. And um, so that's a kind, those, there are different ways to, to participate in opportunities that will help you look even better as an applicant to foundations or um, government funding. With the Ford Foundation, if you go to our website and you look up the Ford Fellows directory, uh, you will see not only scholars throughout the US and in Puerto Rico, uh, but also when you go to our website, there's a system of regional liaisons. There are 36 past Ford Fellows who actively mentor anyone who uh, seek advice. So. Uh, Anyone can contact them. Their email addresses are at our website, uh, Ford Foundation Regional Liaisons. I think that would be a really great resource uh, to avail yourself of. And uh, Jenny, I appreciate what you said. Uh, I think that uh, going to conferences, engaging in conversations with the representative who is there, uh, I think that would be very beneficial as well. Thank you. Are there other questions? Because if not, I have a really basic scoping question. Um, so one of the one of the one of the questions I often get because I am on the front end of some NSF stuff is: Do I have to be a U.S. citizen, and do I have to be studying the United States? Could you say a little bit about um, how your foundations think about those two those two issues? So definitely, um, Rosa Sage is US centric. Um, so all the work has to uh, address uh, a US centered question. Uh, but you do not have to be a citizen. You could be um, based at an institution elsewhere. Um, but your central research question uh, and data need to be uh, relevant to the US experience. Just the same is true of the Loom to Grant Foundation. Um, our mission is to support research on youth ages five to 25 in the United States. So um, that is the case. You can also, you do not, we do not have a citizenship requirement. And we do have a requirement. I think this is also true of Russell Sage that you do have to be, um, we don't give grants to individuals but only organizations and nonprofit organizations. So for most people, that means you're affiliated with the university or research institute, although there is some variation in that, but um, you, you can't get a grant on your own. And for the Ford Foundation fellowships, it's open to US citizens, but also permanent residents and uh, DACA enrolled individuals. So it's important for each of the programs that an individual is looking to compete in to find out what those requirements are for each individual program. But uh, as I said, permanent residents and DACA enrolled individuals can apply in the Ford Foundation Fellowship Program. Great, thank you. I think I'm gonna, we're almost at the end of our time. So I think I'm gonna pass it back to Anthony. Thanks, Becky. 
Um, I want to just make a final note once again to, to all our program officers and all the attendees for participating in this. I think for myself, when I, I like doing these kinds of, of panels because I often reflect on how beneficial it was to learn about not only from program officers and prior scholars, but just to have these kinds of discussion of what it means to be grant active and even the language and the jargon associated with this kind of activity. So I, I, I thank all of you for letting us peek behind the curtain, if you will, um, and sharing some of your experience and knowledge uh, to all of us. So thank you once again, um, and uh, take care, stay safe, and uh, I'll, I'll be sending an email um, thanking you as well. So wishing you all the best and having you a great rest of the day. And I know on the East Coast, it's the end of your day. So yeah. thanks again. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. -bye.